Okay, guys, um, let's talk about some of the results, Manish. We're looking at the nodal temperature distribution here, right? Exactly. So this is the nodal temperature distribution after the process, after my dye has retracted completely. Uh, yeah, it's important. So you can see the temperature difference uh, of the dye, temperature distribution of the dye and the sheet, because definitely this is way much lower when compared to all other locations. And this is the location where my dye is already in contact from the start. And uh, and so that's why it, l it lost almost maximum of its heat when compared to the other locations. And in the coming slides, uh, uh, you would see the temperature variation of a sheet. So this one thing, this this curve I have checked at the point at this location where there is curve and where I can expect my heat flux to be more. So where I can expect my heat to be transferred more. So I have kept this graph. You can see for point, up to two seconds quietly. Uh, this is the area at which I think my contact has been started. So this is the very less heat that is lost due to radiation as well as my gap conductance and mm -hmm. when my contact is started you can see it 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 got decreased to 430 or i could say definitely 400 and less than 400 within two seconds and within this 2.1 uh, i made this just so that i would get to this curve back here why would i explain later because it it depends upon my cct curve cooling transformation curve so that my microstructure uh, becomes uh, like martensitic and I guess you can nicely see here yeah. so that you from the point of actual contact when the release started you go to this transition yes. phase where you have again the gap conductance yeah. which dominates your heat transfer and from there you go back to fairly linear as we have seen in the, in beginning, the beginning because uh, linear is usually um, typical for um, radiation to ambient so exactly. it's, it's quite interesting that we see or Technically, it's it's just logical that we see this S curve. So you have a yeah. linear, then you have this gap conductance, then you have actual true contact. So actual conductance between the sheet and the die. Again, gap conductance, and then again linear um, due to radiation to ambient. So it's uh, what you would expect just based on what you have defined. And so, guys, if you um, redo the simulation without the gap conductance. Um, just check out what this temperature distribution will look like um, without. Exactly. And so that would be interesting. And so this is according to the physical results. So physically, we'll see this type of curve. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you can see this is what I'm talking about. This is the CCT curve for a generally steel, normal 22 manganese boron 5 steel. You can see this is a critical cooling curve. That a cooling curve, uh, the cooling rate should be less than 27 kilo per, uh, I mean Kelvin per second not kilo sorry <laughs> Kelvin per second so if it's falling less than that then we can say we will be reasoning uh, reaching this region like martensite and bannite so that's roughly this is our temperature where uh, we can say our start formation of martensite starts so the according to this the process has been developed so what I'm uh, doing the simulation till now is based upon this so this is one thing that we need to always concentrate when we are doing hot stamping because of my of our we need this uh to our crit cooling crit cooling rate should be less than 27 kelvin per second so uh, that's why I, I just specified this slide and uh, so i guess if we just take a look at mm -hmm. the area or this so what we need to do in order to as a process engineer yeah. Yeah. to say if we will get martin side structure let's say assume we don't have the fancy software at hand that yeah. automatically does all of this for us let's say like um simu factor autoform but just using our um let's say what do you call it like healthy <laughs> thinking so what we would do is check the slope here exactly or a bit more ap approximately yeah. as you've done it like here you yeah. have in um two seconds, seconds you go much? down two by 200 yeah. uh, degrees c um, so you, you, you have 100 Kelvin per second, so you're below that critical cooling yep. rate. So you could justify uh, to your bosses that uh, you will yeah. end up uh, in a martensitic microstructure. Yeah. And this is like part of what we wanted to get out of the simulation. Exactly. Uh, and we can know this basically as a rule of thumb, we can say this, it, this, this is the way it will turn out even without including all the d microstructural mm. effects in our simulation because like um, they will 
not so significantly affect this general outcome of the, the cooling rate because this is more mostly dominated by my, by my um, yeah thermal properties of the materials and the general setup and so on so yeah it's it's kind of interesting to see that we can get this information out of uh, our simulation exactly it's useful for an industry or something like if you're working and knowing that it's good and so you can see the die and this is a bit a uh, weirdish shape i would say this is at the die radii point which we can see it's again this point uh, the critical here or here I would say so I have plotted this curve uh, the nodal temperature again you can see up to as what Joshua told we can see here also the temperature because of the dike this is only due to the gap conductance how it slowly increase and you can see how critical here the shape has been turned out during the forming process and then and this is due to the retraction I mean the, again there is considerable amount of uh, the gap conductance I would say and uh, I think uh, this would uh, explain that why this is happening uh, it explains why the um why there is okay even though we see a drop in temperature yeah. here there is no increase yeah. because the um the how do you say the dissolving of the temperature within the dye uh, is dominating but you can see that um if we would run the simulation for longer, yeah. the body would reach a thermal equilibrium, right? Yeah. So um, if, and here it's interesting that if you activate um, that the dyes can also radiate to the ambient yes. surrounding, then of course the, uh, the long-term um, thermal equilibrium would be 25 degrees C yeah. because it would over time radiate all the um, energy to ambient but if you exclude or do not allow the dyes to radiate to um, to the ambient then all the you can take the integral so to speak of the heat that it's been introduced to the dye during the forming step and then um, distribute it homogeneously over the volume of the dye and then you will get a temperature, an equilibrium temperature that's the same in the whole body, which is above 25 degrees because you, you have a certain amount of energy being put into the body, which then over time just distributes within that body. So you can see this, I think in your simulation, you did not activate exactly, it. Exactly, I did so, not. Yeah, so you would, you almost see that we are reaching mm. an equilibrium temperature of let's say 70, 70 degrees yeah. um, of the body because slowly the heat just dissolves within the dye. So it's kind of interesting to see and to think about what physical, I mean, we are always interesting, uh, interested in the physics of the process, what is going on, what is happening. And so this is why we talk about um, these kind of curves and try to explain what's going on and what's causing the shape and so on. So I just, as, as part of this, um, these tutorials, I always want to um, and most of the things Manish and I are talking about, we didn't really prepare, but it just makes sense yeah. to us what yeah. we are talking about. So this is what I mean. Just tr always try to get to the bottom of the problem and try to explain what's going on. And, and we have a nice thing uh, that we just found out uh, that I'll tell you just in a bit. So but Manish, uh, keep uh, So yeah, this is all the date things which I've written out so that later you can yeah, you can you can pause play, yeah. play an interesting yeah. uh, <laughs> music video in the background and read yeah. through this <laughs> yeah read through this if you wanted to know any important stuff you missed out or something so now I would uh, yeah one other important is spring back definitely because we are dealing with sheets so and that too now at high temperatures but still there might be uh, some spring back so I wanted to know it so that's the reason why we have done a die retraction and then I have plotted the u2 the direction in the y vertical direction to see only the vertical not the magnitude just to see how much it has I could say it's a bumping to the vertical direction people can yeah. see what you're doing with your hands so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, so I have made it into two regions. You can see uh, one and two. This is why you always plot a, um, ex a datum axis system. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. So. it would be really useful. <laughs> so so, so then, instead of doing the hand signals, I can show this. Yeah. You can just say yeah. in, in the y direction. Yeah. In the y direction, yeah. Uh, 
so these two is quite again interesting why we have seen again is like uh, the spring back at one is higher than at two so if i plot this this is at location one you can see when i zoomed in unfortunately i didn't do it's 0.5 mm literally so but when i zoomed in here it's less than 0.05 or or even like 0.08 maximum or something so this is the reason why uh, we can also think about or uh, why the two Springbacks is completely different. So Joshua would explain it. So yeah, because uh, when just talking about it, I will quickly switch to Abacus for you guys uh, once more. Um, we were just thinking about why is it that the springback in this location um, is um, is lower than the one in the center? Because you would expect a lot of the things to be the highest in the center. So, and we stumbled upon a lot of interesting aspects here. So first, um, we noted uh, one thing and you by activating the highest, the maximum value, in this case, it's the nodal temperature again, we noticed, or the FEM simulation give, gave this as a result, um, showed that the highest temperature is not um, in the center of the body, but let's say in the middle of our simulation. I mean, it's a exosymmetric simulation, right? So we wondered why is this? Because um, then we thought about, okay, maybe we forgot something to define, um, like something like a thermal exosymmetric boundary condition here at, um, at this edge. But actually, um, there is no such thing and how could we justify that it is still correct what we do if you go to um, symbols and then check the the heat flux vector this is an interesting thing to use for analysis and then we zoomed in at uh, this element here and we found that the heat flux is only going in vertical direction. So there is a correct boundary condition defined by Abacus for axisymmetric thermal problems. So if there would be, let's say, a wrong boundary condition defined here, and which is not reflecting the axisymmetry of the problem, my heat uh, flux vector would point into um, this direction because then it would radiate to um, ambient if there is a like wrong definition for the sheet. So we could check, so we didn't do an error here. And actually the element that shows the highest node temperature is the one I've marked here. And it's quite interesting to see, it's exactly the element where you have almost zero heat flux. So to the left, the heat flux is pointing uh, to the left and to the right, it's pointing to the right. So it makes, you could either argue, okay, this should be the element where the most energy is taken away from because to the right and to the left but this is the heat flux is defined per element so if there is not a lot of heat flux going out of this element it means the heat stays in this element so the nodal temperature and the heat flux vector it makes sense that um, they correlate and what you can also see is that according to let's say local de let's say deviations or imperfections in which could be also numerically caused there seem to be a higher contact in this area and in this area as well because this is where the flux is flowing to right so it makes sense to again maybe check the contact pressure and i, I hate contact pressure so we would need to play around with the um with the maximum values so but the heat flux can be very interesting um, for an analysis so at least we could rule out using this type of analysis that we did a mistake we could rule out that we did a mistake in the center at the axi symmetric boundary condition so that was fine and we could explain why the highest nodal temperature is here but if we um, go again to um, the contact pressure um, we can also see and now I actually want to um, change the so where is the highest contact pressure again uh, it's in the upper part yeah. um, that's also interesting to see that um, given a certain uh, given a certain displacement the upper body is not only 
the earliest in contact yeah. right from the beginning, but it also experiences the highest contact pressure. You can definitely see it's much higher here compared to the stages one and two. So um, think about the nodal temperature. Um, it's significantly lower in this area um, compared to the other two areas, right? And one other thing you can see in this distribution here is why the, um, the heat or the temperature of this one might be higher compared to the one on the left. Remember, those bodies do not radiate to ambient. That might influence the result, but we ignore this for a second. However, what you see um, due to the contact in this lower part here and also the one over here between these two points over time, you see, right? So just take a look at this area here and this area over time and with the contact of the sheet in this area, the, um, the lower dye actually heats up. So the, the temperature difference, which is usually the most important apart from the conductivity value is the biggest driving force. It's the, it's the difference in the temperatures which drives the heat flow from the sheet to the dye, right? So, and if this difference is smaller than the difference here, it makes sense that the heat tends to stay in the sheet more compared to, I mean, it's, it's a tiny little difference, but it's interesting to, again, take a look at the physics and think about why is this the case? And you can definitely see that here um, the dye is cooler. So the heat flux, if we switch again to the heat flux value, you will see that the magnitude, you could also um, check the heat flux vector as the magnitude, for instance, in the vertical direction. And um, yeah, I don't think with the, uh, we need to specify, let's say, I don't know, I have not checked it before, but I'm checking it on the on the run while we do this. So it's live analysis. So you can see that, uh, um, yeah, so you can see here that the magnitude in the sheet is probably higher. Yeah, so you have positive and negative values here, more so to the side compared to here where you lose. Um, yeah, because you can see here it's purely neg so negative, so it's intaking um, the, the temperature here. Um, so these are all, I go back to auto compute here. So, and we go to uh, nodal temperature again. So again, it is just interesting to think about all the aspects that cause this result, right? So you're presented with the result, but the interpretation of it, it's still up to you, right? So, and this is why in the future we will still need engineers, right? To explain um, why the things are happening the way they are happening, right? And, and what is going on. So I guess that was a nice introduction and um, we'll come back in a second chapter talking about um, artificially introduced um, cooling channels and how they um, will affect um, the results we just uh, talked about. We will brief uh, show you the, uh, the setup real quick and then talk about the results. So see you in the next chapter.